Justice for All, which also works on so many different areas of serious rights abuses in contexts that are very largely ignored, not only in mainstream discourse, but often uh, in, in Muslim contexts as well. Uh, so, Fazim, will your please. Thank you, Aziza. Thank you, Aziza, my fellow panelists, Alex, Sikshashanina, Krishna, and all the organizers of this conference on a very timely and relevant issue faced by 1.7 million Muslims in Canada and 1.8 billion Muslims worldwide, accounting for almost one-fourth of, of the world's population. It's an honor for me to join this conference as a panelist. We are living in a world where Islamophobia not only intersects with settler colonialism, apartheid, and ethnic cleansing, but it also leads to genocide, as seen in India, Kashmir, China, and Myanmar. It is manifested in persecution of minorities, violence against them, and forced disappearances, extrajudicial killings, arbitrary detentions, in massive concentration camps, discriminatory laws as seen in places like India, Kashmir, Xinjiang, and it reflects a pattern of legalized persecution. This includes forced birth controls, sterilizations, and the placements of Uyghur children in state-run orphanages. This pattern is also evident in media and narrative framing, with any criticism of India and Hindutva being labeled as Hinduphobia, and criticism of Israel being labeled as anti-Semitism. Islamophobia is also depicted in, in, in the immigration and citizenship policies in many countries, include, including the Western countries. Justice for All has been campaigning on global Islamophobia issues since 1990s, starting with the uh, Bosnian genocide. We initially operated under the name of Bosnia, Bosnia Task Force, Justice for All Canada has been active since 2012 under the name Burma Task Force. We consistently work on global Islamophobia issues round the clock, from monitoring new developments in the affected region to documenting human rights abuses and mass, mobil uh, and mass mobilization. We engage in lobbying efforts with the US and Canadian governments and collaborate with other Canadian and global human rights groups to bring about positive change in the human rights scenario. Topic of our discussion uh, today is global Islamophobia and Canada's reaction. We have been listening uh, to discussions concerning the manifestations of Islamophobia in Canada. I'm genuinely impressed by the efforts of academic and legal communities in consistently uh, illustrating these intricacies and sub subtleties of this issue. Nevertheless, it is crucial to acknowledge that we do not exist, Canada do not exist in isolation. The phenomena, phenomenon of Islamophobia akin to racism and anti-Semitism is global and transnational. It transcends borders. We inhabit a world that upholds international law. And we all share international obligations as both individuals and as a state. The history of Islamophobia is as old as Islam itself. By the way, how the Quraysh reacted to the Prophet was nothing but Islamophobia. Then the crusade happens, writings of Christian missionaries against Islam and the French philosopher Voltaire writing a drama villainizing Prophet Muhammad, portraying him as a religious fanatic. So the history of French Islamophobia is, history of Islamophobia as well as the French Islamophobia is also very old. And it is also supported by various forms of art. For instance, the 2015 film, American, Hollywood film, American Sniper, recent Bollywood movies, Canada Story, and Kashmir Files. Someone told me yesterday that it was screened for free in Canada. In India, it was 
tax free and the government employees got time off from the official duties to go and view this film and by the way it's a very islamophobic film these all these films are very islamophobic i don't have time to uh, explain as aziza mentioned at breakfast today islamophobia has roots in spanish inquisition in fact the inquisition was a brutal consequence of islamophobia so entertainment media and forms of arts are being used on full scale to villainize muslims and if we look at today's world this phenomenon is still evident in the actions of powerful governments such as india and its attitude towards uh, in its attitude towards muslim population which is the largest minority in the world genocide watch based in washington has issued two genocidal warnings for the advanced stages perpetrated by the bjp led india advanced stages of genocide by the way indian muslims and only muslim minorities are threatened by the stripping of their citizenship through special specific uh, legislations they are facing lynchings on accusation of cow meat consumptions and love jihad the hindutva ruled bjp government has legalized and it's sponsoring this violence since the assumed power in 2014 let me give this uh, disclaimer that hinduism and hindutva do not have identical meanings while hinduism is a religion that is practiced largely in india and among the indian diaspora and has a long history of coexisting with other religions hindutva is an ideology that has roots in nazi nazi fascist ideology which supports discrimination and violence against the minorities i will come to canada's reaction later in india all minorities are facing the worst religious persecution as we all know christian churches are being attacked and burned along with mosques last month within 36 hours 212 churches were attacked in one indian state manipur their women were raped and paraded naked sick minorities persecuted and denied the right of self determination by the most persecuted minority but the most persecuted minority within india which is being attacked under the bjp government is 220 to 300 million muslims bjp leaders are openly calling to kill muslims in large gatherings of hundreds of thousands muslims are being lynched their houses are being demolished on daily basis the chief minister of the largest indian state yogi adyanath is called bulldozer baba because he is famous for demolishing muslim homes and shops the show of brutal power is not confined to india last year a bulldozer was showcased in a rally in the american state of new jersey with pictures of yogi adyanath to show the global power of hindutva they are layered with colonialism and settler colonialism as in kashmir where over half a million to 1 million indian troops are maintaining settler colonialism kashmir by the way is the only muslim majority state under indian occupation they were already facing massive extrajudicial killings arbitrary detentions and forced disappearances rapes burning of houses shops and even entire villages the full impunity enjoyed by the indian army all these human rights violations are meticulously documented in reports prepared by united nations and human rights organizations in 2019 india revoked the autonomous status of kashmir and transformed its colonialism in kashmir into a massive brutal settler colonialism within months 4.1 million domiciles were distributed to non kashmiris mostly oh, sorry can you just tell us if you want us to move the slides as well no 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 don't move slides i just want uh, this is for all i'm sorry <laughs> the first slide only okay. because i'm representing this is for all okay. i'm sorry the entire political in 2019 india revoked the autonomous status of kashmir and transformed its colonialism in kashmir with a massive brutal settler colonialism within months 4.1 million domiciles were distributed to non kashmiris to alter the demography of the region a violation of the fourth geneva convention kashmir by the way is an is a disputed region according to 18 united nations resolutions and geneva geneva convention applies on that the entire political leadership of kashmir has been detained for 4 years 
Some of them, them were already detained. Some Kashmiri political prisoners have spent more than three decades behind bars. One of them is Shabir Shah, who has completed 37 years behind bars, non-consecutively, without being convicted a single time. Justice for All, along with other rights groups, has been pro providing updates to the Canadian government on almost every development for at least four years uh, over Kashmir. However, the Canadian government's response remains disappointing. Besides responding to some petitions stating that we are closely monitoring the situation, they have not uttered a single sentence in the support of Kashmiris and Indian Muslims. Here, I would like to express my appreciation for the NDP leadership and some highly engaged NDP MPs, namely Jagmeet Singh, Heather McPherson from Edmonton Strathcona, Blake Dijarle from Edmonton Breezewa. They have been steadfast in raising their voices in October in response to our campaigns, ours and other human rights groups' campaigns. They issued a national level statement condemning the persecution of Indian minorities. They also uh, protested on uh, the organization of G20 meeting in Kashmir. Some of the liberal MPs have also worked closely with us over Uyghur and Rohingya genocide. Samir Zubairi from Montreal, member of humanitarian community, Salma Zahid from Ontario are among them. But overall, the Canadian government's response is disappointing regarding India and Kashmir. Now let's turn our attention to Islamophobia, a tragedy recognized, uh, I mean, attention to Islamophobia in China, a tragedy that is recognized by, uh, as genocide by China, by Canada. One to three million people are either detained in re-education camps, serving lengthy sentences of 10 to 20 years simply for practicing their faith, or forced into labor camps. It's alarming to note that some of these labor camps are part of the global supply chains. China, as another influential international player, has exhibited concerning behavior towards the Uyghurs, more than one million Uyghurs, uh, as I told, and other Central Asian minorities in Xinjiang are detained in concentration camps. Xinjiang's de-extremification laws prohibit beards, hijab, prayer, and even naming your child Muhammad or Umar. They also restrict visits to certain Muslim countries, including Saudi Arabia, Turkey, and Egypt. What's more, these laws are retrospective, meaning that if you used to wear a hijab four, for four or five years, four or five years ago, you can be convicted today with sentences ranging from 15 to 20 years. And I assure you, this is happening. I've been working on the legal genocide since the fall of 2018. In 2017, when rumors of Uyghurs being incarcerated in education camps emerged, I was a master's student at Harvard, and I had been working on the Rohingya genocide. When I chose Uyghur persecution for a research paper in a write, research writing class, I immediately noticed that the Chinese persecution of Uyghurs amount to genocide with a clear intent element. It's a manifestation of Islamophobia intersecting with settler colonialism and leading to genocide. Forced birth controls and esterilizations have been commonplace for decades. After assuming the power in East Turkestan in 1949, Chinese Communist Party began a settler colonial project. Through demographic engineering, settling millions of Han Chinese from mainland China and eastern provinces in Xinjiang. China also established the world's largest industrial and agricultural project, comprising millions of Han workers in Xinjiang. Uyghur activist Mehmet Toti told me that in 1985, Uyghur students from University of Xinjiang protested against the Chinese government because thousands of prisoners from the inner provinces of China were being settled in Xinjiang. Mehmet also mentioned that 1985 Kurumchi protest was perhaps the first major protest against the communist rule, occurring four years earlier than Tiananmen Square protest. This highlights the extent of demographic engineering and the power of settler colonial project, where prisoners were moved to, Xin when prisoners were moved to Xinjiang. 
And by the way, there were hundreds and thousands of printers from inner uh, cities of China. Previously, the CCP was settling ex-army personals and their families, something akin to what the Indian government has begun doing in Kashmir after the revocation of autonomy in 2019. By the way, settler colonial techniques and brutalities often bear similarities. Uyghurs are also enduring apartheid in their own land, yet regrettably this has not been extensively discussed in the international research community, by the international research community and rights groups. Canadian Parliament recognized it as genocide in 2021, but two years have passed and we have yet to welcome Uyghurs in the diaspora as asylum seekers. Justice for all along with other Uyghur activists has been working tirelessly for this recognition and uh, Uyghur immigration. The good news is that Canada will, always, uh, will do its part in, I mean Canada has allowed, uh, uh, Canadian Parliament has unanimously voted in favour of Uyghur immigration and inshallah from next year we will be uh, welcoming 10,000 Uyghur, uh, Uyghurs. But if we, if we see uh, the extent I mean, uh, the persecuted people in India, in China, in Rohingya, uh, especially the Muslims. We see that Canada has not allowed uh, any immigration, they have not started working on in any immigration for Indian Muslims, although international media, international human rights groups, United Nations have been calling, uh, Genocide Watch has been calling it genocide. They have not, uh, Canada actually recognized Rohingya genocide, I don't have time to explain the Rohingya issue, but Can Canadian government recognized Rohingya persecution uh, as genocide. But we have not started, in, I, I believe in 2018, but in last five years we have not started working on, uh, on Rohingya immigration. And now we are going to, uh, I mean, Canadian government has, is not allowing Rohingyas to come here, settle here, seek asylum here. Although uh, we see that uh, there are about half million to one million uh, Rohingya refugees in Kos Bazar, Bangladesh. So this... It's this interesting, can I just ask, what about support for the camps? Kos Bazar camps. camps? Canadian government actually dedicated some, uh, I mean, dedicated some uh, financial resources for them, uh, about 330 million since 2017. But, you know, uh, we opened uh, immigration for Ukrainians as far as the Ukrainian war started I and mean, Russian invasion of Ukraine started. But we, are, we still are in initial stages of talking about Rohingya uh, refugees and uh, welcoming Rohingya refugees here in Canada. So this is, I mean, Canada's own immigration policy is simply Islamophobic, if you see. Uh, we recognize bigger, uh, bigger genocide. Since two years, we have not allowed them. They will start. We will start uh, accepting them in 2024. Rohingya, no. Indian Muslims, no. Indian Muslim for Indian Muslims, actually, Canada hasn't. Uh, I mean, very disappointing behavior. They have not uttered a single sentence in support of Indian Muslims until now. Although there are uh, valid uh, Amnesty International reports, there are reports from USERF, United States International Religious Freedom, Freedom Commission. Uh, since about four years, they have been uh, insisting the uh, State Department to recognize India as a country of particular concern uh, because of their attitude with the minorities. But, uh, I mean, they, there are valid uh, reports from Am Amnesty International. Uh, Alex, know that if India has almost kicked out uh, Amnesty International uh, and they did not give any access uh, uh, to uh, right groups to uh, in, inside Kashmir. So, and for Kashmiris there is no, there is no such thing. I mean, uh, for India and Kashmir, Canadian government never uttered a word. So their immigration policy, their foreign policy is a big disappointment. They did uh, sanction Saudi Arabia, they did sanction Myanmar, they did sanction Russia, but not India or, uh, I mean, their foreign policy is very selective when it comes to Muslims. And even when they do impose sanctions, it seems like they're not um, enforced properly. So we know that the Globe and Mail, for example, had revealed that all of these Canadian pension funds 
were invested in corporations that should have been covered under the sanctions regime or were listed by the uh, UN fact-finding mission on Myanmar as being uh, corporate, uh, for corporate complicity in the, in the genocide and other politics of the Myanmar military, right? And then um, I think we should discuss that too. This conference convenes at a critical juncture juncture marked by the Canadian government's acknowledgement of extensive foreign interference originating from the Indian government. We have been uh, hearing about uh, the Chinese interference, but this is the first time that Canadian government is acknowledging massive Indian interference in Canada. This interference has reached such a magnitude that it has resulted in a tragic homicide in Canadian soil linked to Indian external meddling, as we know, Hardeep Singh, Nijar. What I would like to repeat is that Justice for All has been working to promote awareness about the global reach of Hindutva on all levels. This is closely linked to global Islamophobia too. The emerging evidence proves that our fears and concerns were not unfounded and baseless when we were talking about threats and violence of Hindutva in the West, in, inside Canada, in UK, and in some other countries. Now, uh, emerging evidence uh, says that this was true. So the government of Canada's reaction was always disappointing before, but now, alhamdulillah, they have acknowledged it. I'd like to draw the focus of this esteemed panel and our audience to the fact that the murder on Canadian soil is akin to the killing of Saudi journalist Jamal Khashoggi, if we see, in Istanbul. In both cases, the intent was to suppress dissent orchestrated by foreign governments. It also shows the global reach of Hindutva extremism. So Canadians are also not safe from these aggressive powers like India and China. At Justice for All, we have been highlighting the pernicious threats of such interference through various channels, including webinars and during our meetings with the Member of Parliament. In August 2023, during an in-person meeting, one Member of Parliament confided in me revealing that we had received a menacing letter from the Indian government. He, has, he had received a menacing letter from the Indian government coercing him to relinquish the public office. So yeah, this, this is the situation of uh, uh, global human rights. I mean, genocides are happening at least in four different regions of the world. In Xinjiang, Canada has recognized Rohingya genocide by Myanmar government, Canada has recognized there are two uh, genocidal uh, warnings from uh, Genocide Watch, Washington-based Genocide Watch in India, one for Indian Muslims and one for Kashmiri Muslims. Canada has not uh, given any, uttered any sentence against uh, these atrocities which are happening. And uh, international media, human rights groups are, uh, and justice for all, and Canadian human rights groups are uh, constantly updating the government of Canada regarding this. So this is the situation, and uh, at the end, I will uh, I would like to say that uh, what cooperation we need from uh, our communities here, Muslim communities and the broader Canadian communities when it comes to Islamopho global Islamophobia. Uh, Thank you. Or were you going to? Just a minute. I, okay. I just want to some conclusion. So yeah, we need, what we need from uh, research community, I mean, this research community has done massive work, as I discussed with Aziza, and I have been discussing with other researchers and authors. MashaAllah, they have been doing uh, incredible work regarding global Islamophobia too. So basically, uh, I, would, I would request the research community to come, uh, the research community and the legal community too. MashaAllah, they are also doing a lot. To come forward, highlight these atrocities, Justice for All, uh, we are a small organization, but we have a database of about 250,000 uh, uh, subscribers. Mm -hmm. So we would like to highlight these issues. We would like you to bring these issues, highlight these issues as experts. And then from uh, Muslim communities, broader Canadian communities, we need support that they respond to our petitions and letters. They can call and meet their MPs using the documentation that Justice for All is producing around the clock. They can promote awareness for updating themselves uh, about the developments in these HR scenarios. 
they can volunteer with us. Uh, the least uh, you can do as individuals is join our newsletter. Right behind this, uh, right uh, outside this hall is uh, Justice for All tables, and we are collecting signatures for our action alerts. So kindly subscribe our action alert and respond. <coughs> just give five minutes per week to our newsletter. I'm just asking this uh, from the broader Canadian communities and respond to our action alerts, petitions, letters, correspondent to correspondence with the uh, Canadian MPs, Global Affairs Department, Prime Minister. So these are the things that we require from you. And thank you for giving me and just for all chance uh, to share uh, all these things. Thank you very much. Both of our presentations have highlighted that the problem in maintaining these very serious um, situations of extreme rights abuses is not simply a deficit of information about what's going on. In fact, it's very well documented what's been going on, as well as the legal interpretation that would say that this is actually something that needs to have something done about it. It's not a deficit of information or analysis, but rather it's a complete absence of political will and investment in the ongoing securitization and demonization of Muslims. So thank you so much to both of you. We are officially out of time for this panel. Uh, Krishna, say, yes, Krishna is just going to come and say goodbye oh, to perfect. us. Is that is that what you're doing? Well, it, well, yes, in part. But uh, I just wanted to. Um, what was I coming up here for? Oh yes, um, we're going to take a five minute break.